Well, what do we do in canon now? What do we do in the covenant? We say that the divine creator creates for each and every spirit, living and deceased, that has or will ever exist a divine trust. Each of you have a divine trust. There is no choice. It is a fact that a divine trust is created for you. And what is placed in that divine trust is an an element of the divine, a spark of the divine. And we call that the divine personality, the corpus, the, the, the divine person. Or if you want to use another word, the soul. But instead of it now being uh, something vague, we're saying no, under trust law, which their system operates under, there is already a divine trust created by the divine for you, and they have no right to that property. None. None at all. So now we have, using their rules, a clear, unmistakable argument to prove their fraud. Once we get them to admit the elements that lead to, they'll never admit that they claim our soul. Never, never. But we can certainly get them to the point where their lying, their lack of admission, their arrogance and their ignorance will doom them. And that is the point of the ecclesiastical deed poll. And, of course, we've spoken about the other trust, the true trust. So the canons, the author of the canons ultimately is not me. Yes, I'm writing it, but it's not me. It's you who keeps saying, I am uh, divine. I am a free person, or not person, I'm a free man. Uh, I am uh, the sovereign of my own body. Yes, absolutely respect that each and every uh, man and woman uh, has absolute right and no one should stand as the agent between you and the divine no one but it's not good enough to simply leave that out there it needs to be clearly defined because it's the absence of that clarity it's those gray areas that these parasites have come in and carved out their little niche and that little niche has ended up being the trap that has enslaved us so the canons are in honour of each of you, not simply me. So when someone says to you, well, the canons are in defiance of the golden rule, what is the golden rule? The golden rule ultimately is equality before divine law, equality before the law, for us each to be treated as we wish to be treated, for each of us to be treated equally. That is the meaning of the golden rule. Just because the words are spoken a certain way, it's understanding what that rule is. Well, if that is the golden rule, and and it is, then for someone to say the rule of law contradicts the rule of equity is an absurdity. Someone is trying to convince you one of the principles of mind control, which is, if I can get you to believe that night is day, day is night, then I have you. So all I can ask, as I keep asking as we go through this, is competence and reading and questioning and discernment are all essential components in in learning this. And I'm not asking you to believe. I'm not asking you to have faith. I'm just asking when you can to be competent, to stand up, to be who you are. They're your choices. Okay, now we've gone over the hour, but there's a couple of things I want to cover first and, and because of that, I still want to get all the questions answered, but I'll answer these extra bits now and then open up for questions. And I want to talk about the next steps of ecclesiastical deed polls. I want to talk about quickly some of the uh, feedback and different things that people are doing. And in particular, I want to add some more flesh to uh, changing our image of what we're dealing with when we actually come face to face with the court. I'm sorry if I've run out of time on some of the other questions, some of the other items I said I'd cover at the start, but we'll carry them over to to the next talk show. So let let me start firstly by um, something in terms of a feedback of people going to the court. Now I said 
that we need to start changing, if we can, our image that we are actually going to a court rather than to a trading floor of a, a branch of a very large private bank. Now, what I mean by a trading floor uh, branch of a, of a very large bank? Well, their laws, which they pretend and claim is the law, is nothing more than bylaws and statutes of a bank. It's all finance. It's all property. And we're dealing, as I say, we're a very large bank. When we go into one of their um, facilities, we are faced with people that are effectively playing trade. They're trading. What do traders have? Traders have accounts. They have trading accounts. And those trading accounts are used to buy and sell property or to store margins. So let's look at who's who in the, in the trading floor that is masquerading as a, uh, as a court. Well, the first thing is we have a uh, buying price and the buying price is called various things. In the UK, it's called the penal sum. And uh, in years gone by, you may see on the internet <coughs> that there's actually evidence that this is a long-standing thing where, where uh, people that were being tortured and killed in the most horrific ways, their families would actually have to pay the torturers. And there's a famous article from the Vatican at its heyday where there was a list of prices, the price of garroting, the price of burning people, the price of tearing out their fingernails. And it is, it is bizarre, but it is actually an authentic document. Well, the, the penal sum and the list of penal sums is the same thing. They didn't stop that. They stopped publishing it. It's there. And that's an essential document in the system. So the penal sum, the buy-in for trading for murder, for example, will vary in different places. I think in the UK, some have said it's four, four million pounds. I don't know what it is in the US, but maybe one of you might say it in the question time. But th that is the buy-in price. Well, who has trading accounts? Well, they all have trading accounts. In fact, you are there as a beneficiary of trading accounts as well because they're using your SESTA KVs as their trading accounts. So let, let's go across to the executor who wants to load you up at the end with not just agreeing to the benefit, quote unquote, of going to prison, but also to sign and therefore become the executor as surety in the performance. That's the prosecutor. What's the trading account for the prosecutor? Well, it's the Crown, the Crown Temple Consolidated Fund. So they have a checkbook. And if the prosecutor fails to get you to buy the trade at the end uh, by signing, they have to pay whatever the buying price is, whatever the penal sum is. What about the judge? Well, the judge has their own trading account and they make a margin, whatever, whether you win or you lose. The only time that the trading account, of, and by the way, if the judge does not have enough in their trading account, they can't hear these trades. So if a judge is starting out or a person starting out into the game and they don't have enough to match the penal sum, then they're not going to be hearing cases. They'll be down the magistrate's court. It's only after they've accrued enough in their trading account do they get to hear the really big cases and get the really big commissions so it's a fantastic incentive get into the courts, started in lower courts get through all those hundreds of parking fines and other things if you can get as many bonds on people as you can and the more money you make the more commission you make the more commission you make the higher you go up in the system and before you know it you've got enough of money in your account to hear some decent murder charges and then when you hear those, boy, you've got some good commissions coming into your trading account. Now, they don't have access to this money directly. But as it is an account and they are the trustee, they may lawfully claim expenses. So it is money indirectly into their pocket. It's why the court, quote unquote, the trading floor is for the trading 
and profiting of crime. It is the most important centres for the trading and profiting of crime. When you hear all these laws saying, you know, we, we, we want to stop people profiting from crime, no, they want to stop competitors from trading and profiting in crime. Why? Because they have the monopoly on the trading and profiting of crime and they do not want anyone else making more money than they do. So the judge is there. Now what, does the judge have a downside? Yes, the judge does. If the judge is challenged for the fact that they are deliberately not following their fiduciary duties, and it's their fiduciary duties that is essential. Procedure, I mean, I saw, I saw a judge use the terribly weak argument when someone was trying to expose the judge. It was a female judge, and it's on a YouTube video, where the female judge is uh, sitting there, and, and this, this fellow said, you know, you are the administrator. Um, you're the trustee of this constructive trust of this matter. She went red with fear. But because he was doing a monologue and didn't stop at that point and then forced the judge to either agree or disagree, he continued. And I understand because you're nervous. They don't want you to be balanced. They want you to be nervous. They want you to, uh, to jump when they say how high. Um, they then went on to the argument that this man needed to go for psych evaluation because he didn't understand court procedure. Complete rubbish. They're there in their capacity as uh, financial officers of the bank trading between one another. It's a complete and utter farce. So under their fiduciary duties, if they fail in their fiduciary duties, and one is to say, Your Honour, I seek leave uh, for an interlocutory appeal on a matter of law, then you watch the attitude of the judge. The judge immediately will change their behaviour, and they will fall into line. Why? Well, the only time a judge loses is when one of their decisions are appealed. And God help them if the appeal goes up the line, because if it goes up the line, they're up for more. So a judge only loses in their trading when their judgments are overturned under appeal. So now you know the weak spot of the judge and and so when we look around the court what we see is a brilliant absolutely brilliant system where even the solicitor the attorney they put in a point to us so that we are then by definition incompetent they they give them money they can't touch it directly but they become addicted addicted to trading addicted to gambling and they lose sight and if you put even the most idealistic person into that environment I guarantee you within five to ten years they will be addicted if they're any good to what comes from that and by that stage they are in perfect mind control and this is why these good people literally can't stop what they're doing I don't think every judge is evil I certainly don't think every prosecutor is evil. But the system is the problem. And you now know something more about the system. Well, we're running out of time for me talking and I want to answer questions. So I'm just going to give you a bit more about what we're doing with the follow-on. And if, if a ecclesiastical deed poll is dishonored. I know a number of you put deed polls in. And I know that you are still getting various reactions, whether they send them back and saying rejected or you put them in court and they won't admit to them. We are dealing in many cases with people who are flat out in horror, flat out lying and looking for every possible avenue to deny. So to that end, uh, I am working as fast as I can to get uh, answers to questions, concerns up on the website so you can go and see the material. But the next steps when there is a dishonour is to issue a bill and the bill is to the injury to the trust property by their failure to honour their fiduciary duties for $10 million. And that bill has been discussed and workshop with a number of people, but I would like a little bit more time to have the final answers before we put it up. I have sent it to a number of you um, as a workshop document, and if someone is absolutely in a desperate position where they need to move forward on that, you can certainly contact us via 
the One Heaven website, uh, and we'll get that out to you.